Hey guys, Seth from Marco Men's Breakfast Club here. Scott from Aristocab.com here, and you, and you and me and him, together, the three of us, we are Marco Men's Breakfast Club. Good morning, Homer. See so what happens when we do things <laughs> out of normal sequence? Was that out of normal sequence? Yeah, it kind of was. Good morning, boy. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Mm. We are smoking some whatever this is. Yeah, this is date and contents, <laughs> according to the bag. A big bag of date and contents. Mm -hmm. Probably one Q. If it's mm. a big bag of something laying around the shop. It's a good chance, but uh, I usually label that. Um, I am smoking in a polished nose warmer, um, but boy is breaking out his Chris Morgan Bones pipe. Yeah, I am. I like that pipe. It too. a good looking pipe. I agree. So, um, today a couple uh, couple things we want to talk about. I don't know about you, because I really don't know you that well, because you don't speak up much. <laughs> but, I find books about business interesting, but sometimes they trudge along. They're, they're thick, they're hard to chew. You know, and they're they're because they're written in a in a technical way. They're al dente. They're difficult to digest. But many many years ago, I had a friend who recommended to me a book on business, but it's actually on on manufacturing and production. A book called ba -da -bum, the Goal. Um, and this one is written by a guy named Elihu. Gold Rat. I always remember Gold Rat. I can never remember the first name. But what's important about this is the goal. And what this gentleman did was he wrote a book that started out with business concepts and manufacturing concepts that he wanted to share, but he realized that they would be relatively dry and, and maybe hard for people to comprehend and digest. So he wrote this book almost like a novel. It's a story of a gentleman who is sent to uh, a couple factories, and he has to assess these factories and make a determination which one the company's going to close. What he finds when he gets to these places is they each have some unique strengths and, and weaknesses, but in general, they run every department very autonomous. And so uh, there's one example of one of the companies has a machine that does a certain thing. Let's say like a CNC machine at a wood shop and it's such an expensive machine and it took such an expensive operator to run it that they keep that thing going 24 7 well the problem is it's so efficient that it creates pallets and pallets and pallets of finished goods that they can't possibly process but if they're not running that machine at full tilt then it, it is impractical to even have right and he introduced to me the concepts of a, a bottleneck. What is it that's stopping those finished products off of that machine from being produced? In a wood shop, the bottleneck traditionally has been a big case clamp. Um, unlike a wood shop, a small shop, where we take out our Jorgensen clamps and our glue bottles and you, you run all the clamps on your cases, and by the time you get around to the other side of the case, um, if it's been 20 minutes, you could almost begin to start taking the clamps off the case. Or by the time you clamp the second case, you can take the clamps off the first. But on an assembly line, they have these giant case clamps that every single cabinet goes into, and that makes them all square, and then maybe they add some staples, or they add some hot glue and things like that. But the case clamp is always the bottleneck. And you'll see piles and piles of goods waiting to go through, funneling into... Mm. That bottleneck. Is that because it just takes a long time to? It just it just takes time. Get it just on takes there time or off. It's all that. Yeah, there's a, the whole juggle of getting parts in place and aligned and assembled. So you'll you'll have people ahead usually staging those parts and getting the dowels in and temporarily knocking things together, and then they go into the case clamp, and then and that at that point, um, in in real production shops, you'll see them using hot melt adhesive around the back of the cabinet where the back meets the side panels and that helps to make things rigid. Maybe there they're attaching a face frame if there's a face frame on the cabinet. Anyway, the whole idea of, uh, of being concerned with throughput, with bottlenecks, 
and, and processes in, in manufacturing are explained so well in this book. But it's explained like a novel. And if, right. and if I have any complaint of this book, it's that it ends before the story ends. Because there's a story of the guy that gets hired who's being sent to these factories. Gotcha. There's a backstory of him and his, and his marriage having some troubles and him trying to work some things out at home. And suddenly, he's done with everything he wants to share. So the story kind of ends. And you're like, well, what happened? Did they ever get back together? Right. What's the... So I'll just tell you that in advance. But when you're done with this book, you will have a greater understanding about how things should be done in manufacturing. Mm. So, Boy was talking with me about some of the stuff that goes on in his new company, and his company manufactures some things. And I asked him, oh, have you read The Goal? And he said, what's The Goal? So here, Boy. Thank you. Got you a copy of The Goal. Awesome. So as part of Mark Woodman's book club, um, get a copy of that. You can pick up. You can pick it up used on eBay for probably a buck. Um, Amazon, inexpensive for a new one. I don't know what that cost. Maybe it was less than ten bucks, I think. But a really good book, a good read. And um, if you have any interest in that, or in lean manufacturing, or anything like that, if you've got a business of any sort, you don't have to be a manufacturer. You're going to learn stuff. You're going to have that bottlenecks book. in your company. You do. You're going to learn some stuff from that book. So read it um, and report back. You cool, report back you. too. I will. After you've read that, let's uh, let's have a conversation about it and okay. uh, see what you think. And I'll get my copy out and read it again too. Okay. Absolutely, we'll do. Um. You know, we we as we were talking about this, I. Uh, um, mentioned something to Homer about this uh, a video and asked him if he had seen this and, and we started talking about that. and So I forced him to watch it and we wanted to discuss it a little bit. Well, hold on a second. He asked me if I'd seen this guy's TED Talk and I said, oh yeah, he talked about this, this, and this. And, and Boy was not connecting with that as being the same video. It turns out it is the same video, but the way and, and the things that connected with me were different than the things that connected with him. It's funny how we all learn differently in right. the messages. Maybe it's because I needed something right. that was different than what That's he needed. Wonderful TED Talk, but this interview that you talked about was... Uh... Well, let's talk about the TED Talk real quick. Uh, so this guy's name, he's an author, and he does a whole bunch of other stuff. His name is Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K. And he has one of the most popular TED Talks, and it was actually one of the TED off-sites. So... One of the not the big, big TED talks, main stage but, TED talks. Yeah, but his was his content was so good that TED actually reached out to him and asked him if they could put his content, his his talk on their main uh, YouTube channel. And when they did last time I checked, I think it's uh, a couple million views on it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think I believe the title of the TED talk is "Start with Why." That's also the title of his book, Start With Why. He also wrote the book, uh, Leaders Eat Last. And a new book that I've ordered, I don't remember the name of it right now, but when I get 50, it... 50... No. No, not that one. No. Um, I, I don't remember it right now, but I've just ordered it. It is only being sold in hardback because they, they wanted to do things to it to make it tangible. Um, with the, the hope of a tangible book being given to somebody else, creating a human-to-human -human interaction. So they've, they've done things like they, they created a smell that the pages have this perfume on them that uh, you specifically um, on the book so that you can't replicate that in a digital format. Hey, before you go on, I bought a book at a pipe store a book called, I think it's called Pipes, or the Pipe Book, by a hacker. And this book, I'd seen it there before, it had been thumbed through for years, you know, it was some, one of those books that probably should never have been offered for sale. It was like, it should have been the one that they let you see, and then you buy the ones that are wrapped in plastic, right? But I bought it. All these years later, it's got to be 15 years later, I opened that book, it smells like a pipe shop. It is wonderful. That's cool. They before they sold that book, they should have put it in a pipe shop for fifteen years. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. 
Yeah, so he's wanting to do something like that with this newest book. Um, his TED Talk and his, his first book, Start With Why, uh, talks about how the very best businesses and the very best leaders, instead of telling people, like most companies do, telling them, most companies and most leaders will tell them what we are going to do, what we create. So, for instance, using Apple as a case study, most computer companies would say, what we do is we make computers. And um, then a next layer down is how, how we do it. And that matters to some people. But so few companies actually get to the heart of the matter, which is why. And Apple is one of those companies that says why. We make, we make technology to change the world. Yeah, we, right? we, we make your life better. <laughs> we empower you to, to live the life you want, to, to show off your artistic side. Right? All of those things, those things tell why of a business. And they connect at a heart level. And so a lot of what he talks about is that. So in this, that's his TED Talk. You should absolutely go and watch yeah, it. it's really good. So he recently did an interview. And this interview, he talked about leadership. Um, he talked about how to be a good leader, how leadership is so hard. One of the things that really stood out to me is that uh, he said, he said, I quote, leaders are, there's not a leader in the world who is responsible for the results. The people that they lead are the ones that are responsible for results. The leaders are responsible for taking care of the people and helping them become the best versions of themselves to reach those results, creating an environment where they can reach those results. Mm. And that's something that I ran into when I was working at the plumbing company. There was a misunderstanding of that, I think. And so oftentimes I was, I was um, perceived as not doing uh, my job as a, a leader, as a manager, um, because the expectation is that I should have been doing the job of the people that I was leading. You should have been plumbing. I should have been answering the phones when I was managing the call center. And I should have been, yeah, dealing with the plumbing. I, I should know how to be a plumber um, in my position. And there were a few people that understood that and would come to my defense. And so hearing that, you know, really stuck out to me. Um, but uh, what I want to talk about right now is he, he eventually got to the section where he answered the question, which is apparently one of the most common questions he's asked, and that's, what about millennials? Okay, let me, let me stop you and then we'll continue yeah. on. I stopped watching this video about halfway through, and I told Boy why. I, I was playing it at double speed, just so I could, it was an hour long and I didn't have time for it. But something that irritates me immensely is interviewers who do most of the talking. I didn't tune in to listen to this interviewer. I don't know who he is. Maybe he's a wonderful guy and that I should really listen to him. But I, I, it was really irritating me. Boy, on the other hand, didn't pick up on that and said that the good stuff came in the second half. I didn't listen to the second half, but the conversation... Uh, that, that Boy got from that, or the information, is something that's really interesting to me, so I'm going to have to go back and watch it. You didn't listen to it? You didn't go back I told you it? I didn't listen oh, to the, the second half. Millennials, though, as a trainer, it, it's a challenge because what motivates our younger employees is dramatically different than what motivates mm -hmm. our older employees. Mm -hmm. um, our, our older employees appreciate the history of the company, the patents, the successes that we've had, the, the things that they've seen, and they love to you know, kind of, uh, you know, talk about the things, oh, remember when we did this and that. Well, a brand new person doesn't care about any of that. You know, they want to know how are they going to make a difference. Right. And, and that's the kind why. Of, kind of that army of one thing, right? That's the why. No, yeah, I know, I know. So, continue. So, so a millennial, by his definition, is anyone born 1984 or later? I would say they're within that range, different categories, right? So I'm on the upper end of that age limit, and so not everything that he talks about really applies to me. Um, but some of the things that, that he mentioned, he said, he said, the generation that came before the millennials decided collectively that they wanted to give their children everything, everything that they never had, everything that they could ever want. And they were successful in that. Mm -hmm. And so what is the result of, of what do you get when you have a person who has been given 
everything. You end up with someone who... Expects everything to be given to them. Expects everything. Yeah. You end up with someone who doesn't know the value of things. You, uh, you know, he talks about participation trophies and how it undercuts the value of the, the from the people that have worked hard to reach their accomplishment. Right. But who gave those participation trophies? It was those people who worked hard for their accomplishments. Right. It's crazy that right. we did that. Yes. And. And and then to compound it, he talks about the, the, the role of the role of technology and the cell phone and, and what we're doing to our kids now, really, more than uh, or over the last ten years. Um, cell phones cell phones elicit, elicit a dopamine response. Dopamine is the drug that you get when you uh, run, when you have sex, when you uh, drink alcohol. It's the feel good drug that your brain produces, and um, People that have addiction problems are people that get hooked on dopamine in one form or another when they're really, usually, most typically in their teens. Because developmentally, we're designed that as children, we gain our worldview from our parents. Our parents are the ones that shape our worldview as children. And as we develop out of that and into our teens, our worldview is, is sociologically should be shaped by our peers. But what ends up happening, and they see this with alcoholics, is um, most people who are alcoholics as adults started drinking alcohol as teenagers. And what happened is when they should have been going to their peers for uh, their worldview, for acceptance, for things where they had challenge, they would instead go to alcohol. And so they're... Or their peers with alcohol. Yes, but, but then their peers are also alcoholics with them. And, and so what ends up happening is they became dependent on that substance for the dopamine and it's it becomes very difficult to break that habit as you go forward and so they struggle with true intimate relationships right which is one of the 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 huge things about aa is is repairing relationships because if you don't have relationships you're not going to be successful and he says you know the 12th step of aa is helping someone else recover that is the most significant step and that if you do not do that, you are most likely to relapse. Mm. That, that, that's the biggest, most significant factor, is if you are helping someone else through the process. Um, and so, uh, cell phones and the response from the cell phone, so every time you get a text message or a Facebook message, um, that response elicits the same sort of dopamine. And so one of the things that he says we have given our children, we have given millennials, when they are in their most formative years, all, is a device that gives them the same kind of mental uh, brain uh, chemistry Simulation. hit that alcohol does. It's as if we've given them the keys to the liquor cabinet, and and then are surprised later that they're connected, that they're hooked on this technology. Oh, and, and the withdrawal is real when you it take, absolutely when you, is. when you take uh, electronics from kids. Yes. it takes days for them to get over that. Yes, mm. and so so he said, what happens as a result of that is we have this whole generation that genuinely doesn't know how to cope with real-world relationships and real-world responsibility. And so you get into the workforce and you have employers who ask because they are genuinely, they genuinely want the best for their employees. They ask, what can I do to help you grow? What can I do to help make you happy? And the, the true and sad reality is the millennial has no idea because in that environment, they are completely unequipped and unprepared to deal for with someone it. to say, here, this they have, will make you complete. Which is why they job mm. hop, mm. because they have no idea what they're looking for. They don't know how to answer that question. Um, you know, but, but he talks about, and one of the things that really, really struck me, and, and he says, he'll, he admitted in, in this interview, he said, it is ridiculous and sad that I have a job, because all I'm telling people to do is, is be good in your relationships. Have trust with other people. Mm. Um, but he said, uh, with with our relationships, if your cell phone is is more important than the person that you are with, you have a problem. And he said, we don't think about and realize the ways that we convey this, but it is true of many of us. If you have, if you're sitting at the dinner table and you put your phone out on the table, face down or face up, it doesn't matter. 
what you are conveying is while this meal and this time together with you is important to me, if this thing here buzzes or makes a noise, it's going to be more important in this moment. Right? He said, we have a generation of people who, when they wake up, they, they reach for their phone before they reach for their spouse. Mm. You know, that hit home with me because I'm absolutely that person. He said, if that's a problem for you, if that's something that is a significant, if you're losing opportunities to build deeper relationship with the people that you love and respect and care for. Put the phone on your spouse's nightstand. Put your phone in the... <laughs> put, yeah. he, said, he, he said, put your phone in the other room. Charge it in the living room. But I use my phone as my alarm clock. Then get an alarm, alarm clock. clocks are $8. I'll buy you an $8 <laughs> alarm clock. Because because it's, it's just so ingrained in us. And, you know, I find myself doing that. He said, you, you're in a meeting room full of people that all have their phones out. Um, you, you, how many times are you at dinner and this is what we're doing? As if this thing is more important than these relationships that are around us. And, and to us it is because we're addicted. We're addicted to that dopamine hit. We're addicted to that attention. He said, you know, you can see it sometimes when, when you're feeling down, you're feeling lonely, and you send a whole bunch of text messages out to people. Or you send, you send a, a, a message on Instagram, hey, everything's great, just to get... You're hoping for and praying for other people Some to say, yeah, oh, yeah, you, things are looking good. Oh, I hope you're having a great day. Man, that rocks. All of that stuff. And it's fabricated. And um, millennials, and, 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 and I most think... most of those people will never sleep with you. Yes, most. Um, I, I think he's talking specifically about millennials, but I think that, that it is something that has developed uh, beyond millennials. It's, it's a habit that many of us have, have developed. Um, I didn't grow up with cell phone access constantly at my fingertips, but I am constantly splitting my attention between something that is very important to me personally and something that is totally insignificant, um, but I give it more of my attention than, than I should. Interesting. So, um, we'll so have a link. You, what do you suggest that you do, that you have your wife text you more? Yeah, that's, uh, we're, we're getting on a, a, a Skype account and yeah no. um now i suggest that you guys watch this video i think it's worth the time speed it up in two times if you have to wait until dinner um, though before you turn your phones right. on and watch this video and and recognize that that uh that you might not be sending the message that you intend to or you might be sending the wrong message um to those people that you love around you mm. so it's powerful stuff yeah all right, I'm going to watch the second half of this video. You should do the same. Let us know what you think about that. Can you turn your phone off? I know I struggle with that. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, we're going to head out of here. Make it a great week. See you next week. See ya.